Okay, hello everybody. Um, as you probably know by now, but if you don't, you can cl double click on any one of the various screens that you want to make big, so you're in control of your own destiny here. So, this talk for the next 30 minutes or so, if I um, remember to put my timer on, what time are we in now? Quarter, right, okay, so we've got till uh, quarter past. Right, we're going to be talking about running agencies, uh, uh, um, businesses, or freelancer businesses, and about one of the biggest challenges that go alongside that, which is bringing work. And I've called this talk, Stop Relying on F uh, Referrals and You Need a Marketing Strategy. Um, I, I, and I kind of did that a little bit on purpose because I know talking about marketing strategies is going to put off a lot of people. Um, I know you don't normally want to put off your audience, but I want this just for people that are serious about building their um, their web design businesses. So let's look at the subject of referrals. Let's look at how you can bring in work over the next half an hour. I think the first thing to say um, is we need to look at why referrals are not enough. What my problem is with word of mouth recommendation, because everybody says how great word of mouth recommendation is, don't they? They talk about, you know, uh, oh yes, I've never had to advertise in my life. People just come to me because I produce amazing work, right? Well, don't get me wrong, referrals are great and they should always be the lifeblood of, of any good service-based business um, like you guys are running, but, they do have their limits. And I think it's really important to be clear about those limits and to have a plan for um, kind of dealing with those shortcomings, all right? So, so let's look a minute at, at what the problems are around referrals. Well, the first thing to say is that referrals are passive. So what do I mean by that? Well, if the phone stops ringing one day, right? If you stop getting contacts via your website, what can you do about it? How can you bring in more work? Maybe, I don't know, there's a global pandemic where suddenly your normal work stream runs out or goes quiet. What can you do then? And that's the trouble with relying purely on word of mouth recommendation that there, very, there is very little you can do, right? You could harass your existing clients, asking them to recommend you to other people. But let's be honest, that's probably not the most sensible of strategies. And then you're stuck. So although referrals are really great when they come, you can't rely on them because you don't control them, right? You're not in control of the level of work that comes in. The second problem with referrals is they tend to lead to more of the same kind of work. Now, not always, you know, there are there are exceptions. But what tends to happen is, well, let me give you a real life example. When when I ran an agency, um, we we won one random client, um, which was a university. And from that, they recommended us to other universities. And so we did university after university after university after university, which is fine. Good work kept us busy. But there are a couple of problems with it. One is you get bored of doing university websites after a while. But also, a lot of us have got ambitions in our businesses. We want bigger and better kind of clients. Um, and, and so referrals are not going to get you to that place because it's probably going to create more of the same kind of business. So that's the second problem with referrals. The third problem is you can't plan for growth. OK, so most of our businesses end up growing um, because of you, we just get more referrals in. So we grow the business. Um, maybe talk, take on more work or whatever else. Um, and, and so we kind of grow organically like that, which, again, is fine, but it's unpredictable, right? You have to have been consistently and painfully busy for quite a long time before you're confident enough to hire another person or to, if you're a freelancer, get that office space that you wanted to, right? So it, it, there's, no, there's no strategy behind it. 
right? There's no, uh, no solid way of operating. So those are some of the basic problems with referrals. But I will reiterate one more time that there is nothing wrong with referrals. I'm not saying you shouldn't have them. I'm saying that you shouldn't rely, them on, rely on them by yourself. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, but I've got enough work, right? Enough, I've got enough stuff coming in from referrals. Why do I, why do I need to worry about this, right? Well, because you can never have enough leads, right? You might have enough work to keep you busy, but that doesn't mean that you have enough leads, enough opportunities, right? And there are two reasons for this, right? The, um, the first reason is if you have a lot of leads, then you can start firing clients that you don't like working with. Or you can start not taking on jobs that don't really excite you because you know you've got enough other opportunities to keep you busy. And then secondly, right, the more leads you have means the higher rates you can charge, all right? Because you can basically start go, uh, pushing the price up and up and up until um, supply, right, the amount that you can supply um, is no longer um, uh, being, you know, blown out of the water by the demand. In other words, the demand is no longer higher than the supply, right? So even if you can't physically take on more work, you still want more leads because it lets you be more choosy, it lets you charge more. So I'm now at the point in, in my um, freelance business, my consultancy business, which is now just me. I, the agency I work with is still going, but um, I, I no longer run it. So in my business, I charge probably a third more than I used to do at the agency because I've got more leads and yet it's just me that I need to keep fed, right? And so I work less hours than I would have previously worked, right? Because, okay, you might not want more money, right? Um, I don't particularly, I've got a salary that I'm perfectly happy with and that's fine. But if I charge more, I can work less hours, which means I've got more time to work on personal projects or spend time with the family, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you get the idea of why we want to do more than just referrals. So the, the next question then unsurprisingly becomes, well, what should we do, right? How do we start to do things? Because I'm quite realistic here, right? If you're running an agency, if you're a freelancer, let's be honest, you've only got so much time available, haven't you? You've got to be most of your time, if you're a freelancer, as much time as possible needs to be chargeable work. If you run an agency, the chances are you're not just doing sales and business development for, for, full time, you're also running projects and doing other things as well. So what we need is something that's very lightweight. So that's the first criteria, but we'll get onto more criteria in just a minute. But before we do that, I want to talk to you very briefly about, well, what doesn't work, right? Um, because I see when people think about say, selling and marketing their businesses, they often go down a route that really isn't particularly useful to them, right? And there are three things that um, the, the agencies and the freelancers I coach, um, I see three mistakes coming up time and time again that people are making. Mistake number one is they turn to cold calling, right? Um, now, either they do this, and by cold calling, I don't just mean picking up the phone. I mean cold emailing or any, you know, those kinds of techniques. Now, I've got two problems with, with cold calling. Three, if you account the fact that it's flipping annoying to receive, right? But the, the two main problems of it, one is it's soul destroying, Right. It's the incredibly demoralizing thing to do. So you might think, well, I'll pay somebody else to do that. You can get companies that will actually generate leads for you um, by doing this kind of cold calling. But actually, it's a very ineffective way of operating. And the reason that it's a very ineffective way of operating is all about timing. Because in with these kinds of unsolicited contacts, whether it be email, cold calling, or even another one I'm seeing a huge boom at the moment is random emails being sent out on LinkedIn, right? Your timing needs to be impeccable. 
you have to hit that prospect at exactly the moment that they're ready to buy, right? At exactly the moment they're thinking, I need a web design agency, I need a freelancer. Because if you hit them too soon, right, then, then they're going to forget about you by the time they actually come to hire that person. If you hit them too late, obviously the opportunity is gone. So probability wise, it's not the most effective technique that's available to you. So the cold calling is one mistake. Another mistake I see a lot of people make is advertising. So they'll sink money into things like Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, Google ads, that kind of stuff. Now, I'm not saying that they don't work. They do work. But they're a bit of a crapshoot, right? Uh, and the reason that they're, um, they're not very good odds is because, yes, in this case, people are ready to buy because they're responding to an ad. So therefore, we know that they're at the point of buying. But there's no relationship. There's no reputation there. They don't know you from Adam. You're just somebody they Googled, right? Um, and so your probability of winning that work, you're probably going to go into a pool of uh, maybe three or more other agencies um, uh, that you're going to pitch for the work with. Your probability of, 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 of winning that project is pretty low, right? Because there's nothing to set you apart from anyone else. In fact, in many cases, you might just be making up the numbers, right? They've already got a preferred supplier, but they have to go out to tender. So they Google a couple of other people and throw them on the list, in which case you're wasting your time entirely, right? So advertising has got its limits as well. And then the third mistake, the third thing that doesn't work particularly well is isolated blogging and social media updates, right? So this is where you go, you, you go every now and again, okay, yeah, I need to do, I need to do some marketing stuff. Maybe it's gone a bit slow. Maybe there's not much going on in the business at the moment. And so you think, oh, I need to bring in some work. So what do you do? You put some stuff out on, on Twitter and you maybe write a blog post that you haven't blogged about in months, right? You're wasting your time, okay? That is not going to generate quality work over time, right? Now, all of my work does come in through those methods, but only because I'm doing it regularly and consistently, and I invest quite a considerable amount of time in, in working in that kind of way. And I had the advantage that I started doing blogging and social media updates like 15 years ago. So I'm well established uh, um, in that field. So it's not something I recommend to the people that I mentor and I work with. Because essentially, it requires too high maintenance to, to keep to do it at a scale that actually works particularly well. Now, that's not saying that I don't use blogs and I don't use social media updates, but we use them in a much more tactical kind of way. So let's go back to what we actually need from this. Right. What are we trying to achieve? If we're saying those aren't going to work very well then what are we actually trying to do? Well, we're trying to do th three things. First of all, we want to be there at the moment that people are ready to buy, okay? To overcome the problem with cold calling, okay? We wanna be there at that critical moment when people have said, I wanna hire someone. Secondly, we wanna establish ourselves as a trusted expert, okay? So we're not just someone else they've Googled, we're their preferred supplier, their, their go-to person in that particular situation. And the third thing we want to be able to do is we want to have regular contact with our audience so that we can succeed in doing those other two things, right? If we have regular contact, we know that they're going to have heard of us relatively recently um, uh, uh, when they come to buying. So we're going to be in the front of their mind. And if we've had regular contact, we can establish ourselves as a trusted expert. Now, there would have been a time when you could achieve that regular contact through blogging because people would subscribe to blogs and they would follow blogs. That doesn't really happen anymore, right? People don't follow you in the same way. Equally, there was a time when that would have worked on social media because people would see your social media updates and follow them. But that there's so much now that it's easy to get lost. 
So let's get to the, the nub of the problem. What do you need to do? Well, what you need to do is build something called a sales funnel. Now, what we're talking about here is a lightweight way of drawing people in. So, so here's, here's a very kind of summarized version of what a sales funnel looks like. You first of all get their attention through things like social media, through guest posts, through speaking at events like this, through um, well-ranked SEO posts, through all those kinds of methods, all the kind of standard stuff. But then you suck them in and take them to a landing page, which encourages them to sign up to a newsletter. And you encourage them to sign up to the newsletter through something called a lead magnet. Then that takes them into an onboarding series, an ongoing email newsletter where you engage people over time. So let's break that down a little bit more um, and explain how that would work in practice. Well, first of all, right, you need to grab your audience's attention. Now, you're not going to grab your audience's attention just by throwing out some random posts every once in a while and some random social media updates. You've only got very limited time and resources in order to market your um, your services. And so just kind of spewing out random posts is not going to dent the plethora of information that is being thrown out on the Internet. And to which many people are blogging really for their peers. Right. You know, other people, they're talking about techniques and that kind of thing, um, which aren't your audience. So. If you're going to, to do this kind of attention grabbing at the top of your funnel, you need to focus very specifically on your audience. So remember that university example that I gave earlier? Well, I didn't tell the whole story. We didn't just win one after another through referrals. We also decided to target that audience. And so I started writing posts aimed specifically at higher education institutions. I joined mailing lists where um, higher education institution web managers spoke to one another. I attended events where they went. I posted social media updates uh, uh, to that audience, sharing with them, talking with them. So you need a very targeted effort to grab people's attention. Now, once we've got their attention, right, the next step is that landing page and lead magnet. OK, so what is a lead magnet? Well, a lead magnet is essentially um, an incentive to encourage people to sign up to your mailing list. OK, so um, it, it's got to offer people something of real value. So I'm going to share with you my lead magnet at the end of this that I want you guys to do. Right. And that is a free course that goes into what I'm covering in 30 minutes in a lot more detail. Right. So that's my lead magnet to draw you in. And equally, you need to produce one for your audience. So maybe you you've decided you're going to focus just on the hotel and leisure industry, which I probably wouldn't recommend at the moment because they're not the most affluent in the current situation. But let's say you were then maybe you would produce a um, checklist of things um, that that uh, hotels need to consider with their communication online communication strategy during COVID, right? Maybe you've decided to target um, uh, charities. So you produce a small course, which is aimed at charity owners, right? And you give this away in return to encouraging people to sign up. But then it's not just your lead magnet that needs to be providing value. You also need to demonstrate that the mailing list they're going to sign up for is going to provide ongoing value as well. So you need to demonstrate that you're going to be giving advice on user experience or development or whatever your areas of specialty to help people improve their digital presence and achieve their business goals. So you're kind of taking people on this journey where you're trying to systematically um, improve their, you know, engage with them more and more over time. So you grab their attention. Then we we basically want permission to keep talking to them. OK, and that's where our kind of, lead, you know, the lead magnet gets that permission and then we can continue to talk to them. And then the final 
um, the, or the next step in the process is, is a nurture series or an onboarding series. So when someone hands over their email address, you want to, that, that's a critical point because one of two things happens at that point. Either they stay subscribed or they take the lead magnet and go away, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to prepare a whole series of emails that go out over, a, you know, the next few weeks. That, that introduces them to all the knowledge and value and expertise you can share with them, okay? And you, you pop those go out over a series of weeks, bang, 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 bang. Um, and then in those, you're also introducing them to the services you offer, okay? In the same kind of casual way, I've dropped in a couple of times into this talk that I do mentorship and coaching, right? So you're going through this, this journey with them. Now, the great thing is, is that once all of this has been set up, once you set up that landing page with that lead magnet, once you set up that onboarding series, then essentially all you need to do is just keep pushing people into the top of it and you don't need ongoing work. It's not like you've got to blog every week or you know, do social media updates every week. All you need to do is create one or two good performing posts on certain targeted keywords or speak at events or do whatever else you, you fancy doing. And it can even be periodic to feed people into the top of that funnel um, and get their interest. Series where you're onboarding people, there are three things that you need to consider. First of all, you need to demonstrate your expertise. Show you know what you're talking about in your area of expertise. The second thing you need to do is empathize. And by that, I mean that you need to be able to demonstrate you understand the particular challenges um, that your audience are facing. What are the particular things that they're struggling with? So it might be so, for example, um, with the higher education sector, I know that if I start talking about winning international students, I will gain their attention that, because that is a big goal that they want to achieve. So, uh, um, uh, to move people from one-off gifts to ongoing gifts. So I know that if I can get them to start giving monthly rather than just doing one-off gifts, that I'm going to meet a pain point that they face. So understanding and responding to your audience in these series happens really well. And then the third thing is you need to keep offering value over, over throughout that whole onboarding process and on into the future. So once you've done the onboarding process, once you've got your lead magnet in place with your landing page, you're just get, you're getting people involved. And then all you need to do is follow up with an on. And not for when they come to buy. Um, and what you're doing through those those emails is encouraging um, engagement. You're trying to get them so that they're they're speaking to you and talking to you because you want to get to the point where you've got some kind of interaction going, so that you're um, you're beginning to build a relationship there. Um, so you know they actually like you and want to work with you, and you're there, maybe even doing one-off calls with some of them and getting chatting with them and that kind of thing. And then you also need to be continually providing value in every single email that you send out. And really, effort to set this up, right? Yes, you're gonna need to do occasional, sporadic, whenever you can efforts to put people into the top of the funnel. In other words, do the odd speaking engagement, do the, um, a, a, some local meetup, take part in a mailing list, you know, um, do that kind of thing. 
But then beyond that, it's really just one email a month that you have to do in order to keep your audience engaged. And the other great thing about taking this email based approach rather than relying on social media is that social media platforms come and go. OK. People in B2B, which is who we're aiming at, we're a business, to, we work in a business to business market. We're hiring, you know, we, we were hired by businesses, not directly by the consumer. Those are people that are checking their email probably multiple times a day. So you're much more likely to get their attention than you are through something like social media, et cetera. So that's a very, very brief overview of the kind of um, methodology that you can put in place to start building a regular stream of work over a prolonged period of time. Now, like I said, I've got my own lead magnet here. I actually have a course called Finding Clients, which is a whole masterclass that goes through this. It's like five hours worth of material taking you through this process step by step. But it's actually not open to the public at the moment. I open, only open it twice a year so I can support people properly. Um, but there is a free uh, course at the same URL. So if you go to that URL, you can get a free course that will take you through in a little bit more detail how this all works in, in, uh, in, pro, uh, in practice. But essentially, that's all I want to share with you today. It's a lightning short talk. I'm happy to take any questions that anybody has at this stage. Any concerns or any yeah buts? Any, um, uh, you know, things that people aren't quite sure about or they can't see it working in their situation, I'm happy to answer questions. But if you want to dive off to the main stage, I don't blame you. Go, shoot, ask anything you want and I'll, I'll spend as long as you want answering your questions. Oh, Derek, I'm really pleased you said that because I'm very conscious this is a this is the kind of topic that's not quite so popular amongst the smashing audience because you're also, you know, you're 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 right on kind of cool people and don't like to talk about evil things like marketing and sales. Um, so I appreciate uh, the encouragement, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you've got. Oh, great, thank you, Paige. Um, I might have a question just to start off with. If that's oh, okay. Good. Yeah, go for um, it. Because interestingly enough, you talked a lot about universities as a uh, as a pinch mm. point. Our, our agency also, we did a lot of work with universities because you know how it goes. You start with one. And how, I mean, it's not much, much a marketing question, it's more about kind of agency running in it as a general thing. How did you keep your designers happy? Because after five university websites, it was yeah. just. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's one of the problems right at the beginning. I, I was saying that that the trouble with relying on referrals alone is you just get the same kind of client one after another. What we did is we were a little bit more strategic about it because that process that I just outlined. Right. You could create a landing page aimed specifically at universities with a lead magnet for specific universities and then an onboarding process specific to university. Then they go into your general mailing list, right? Now you can take that same process and repeat it for the charity sector at the same time, right? So you have a landing page dedicated to charities. You have a, you know, have a, um, a lead magnet dedicated to them and onboarding, and then they go into the same mailing list as everybody else. But that enables you to basically diversify by by enabling you to target multiple sectors at the same time, so that you don't all go slightly stir crazy by doing the same kind of work again and again and again. You know. Because it is, it's really dull, you know. Any, uh, yeah. It doesn't matter how, how exciting the client is, you know, even if you were doing record labels, I've always wanted to do a record label website for some reason. After your fifth or sixth of them, I imagine it gets samey. What's the best performing email that you've ever sent out um, on your own marketing efforts? 
I don't tend to get too caught up with tracking individual emails like that. I look for trends instead um, because it's very hard to replicate what happens on one particular email. And there could be all kinds of reasons why a single email um, uh, performs better than others. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at a general overall increase in the quality of, of A, the size of my mailing list, but B, the quality of it. So um, I have an open rate of just under 40% on average, which is extremely good. And I have an average click-through rate of about 6%, which again is pretty good. Um, and it's those metrics that I'm looking at, at improving over time. So yeah, don't get too hung up on individual ones, otherwise you go slightly crazy. I wonder how you get start, um, uh, uh, you started as a freelancer from scratch. Um, how to get started? Well, um, my advice in that situation is start off by A, defining an audience that you want to reach, right? And, and this is going to be defined partly by any previous experience you've had. So if you've had experience working in-house for, I don't know, universities, let's say, then you might well want to target them then to begin with. But it might also be because you've got a particular interest. So one of the people that I work with, um, mentor at the moment, what, loves working with sustainable businesses, and we're targeting those. And, and the first thing I do is create that landing page and that lead magnet and that nurture campaign so we create that those three elements to begin with then what we do is um i encourage them and i talk about this in the master class you do two things first of all you identify you do a bit of research and you identify any influencers in that particular sector right so are there particular individuals or blogs or mailing lists or events that are, are in the sector you wanted to reach and you create a whole list of those right and then separately, you also make a list of um, clients that you would like to work with, right? Then specific individuals within the companies, normally heads of marketing, people like that, you get their email addresses. And then essentially what you do is contact these people and you say, look, I've got something of value that I've, you know, I've created for you. Um, and you, you start to engage with these people and actually the, the way that I outline in the masterclass is a little bit more complicated than I've covered here, that basically the lead magnet that I create would be something like, say you're a UX specialist, right? Um, it would be, and you wanted to target the university sector. You would say, we're going to write a report on the state of user experience within university websites, right? Um, and so that would be, the report that's going to be your lead magnet but even before you started writing it i will co i contact individual people within various universities i also contact the influencers and i say i'm writing this report i'd love you to complete a survey on it i'd love a quote from you about it and so i use that as an opportunity to start engaging with them and having a conversation nothing to do with selling my services but about establishing my credibility so that when i then have written the report and their name is in it and um, then they're much more likely to want it and to join the mailing list and all of those kinds of things. So, yeah, you can absolutely build from scratch. It doesn't need to just be what most people do when they start from scratch, which is friends and family. Right. You could be much more targeted than that and, and set a firm foundation from day one. Any more questions? You have to sit for the awkward delay, don't you? This is no. <laughs> <laughs> well, this bit is fairly, fairly fast, so it's not like on main stage where there's 15 second delay. Oh, um, I see. It's the main stage that's got the bigger delay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it sounds I, like I, we, I think we're good. I think yeah, we've we've got we've done them, haven't we? So, I mean, I'll say to you guys, if you, any of you want to um, ask follow-up questions, drop me an email to paul at boagworld.com. I'm more than happy to answer them because, I mean, like I said, there'll be some people watching this that um, that, that are watching the video afterwards. You, you're more than welcome to send me that. If you want to get that free course, you can go to boagworld.com forward slash finding dash clients. Thank you very much. And I'm fairly sure we'll be inviting you at some point again for Smashing TV.
So, yeah. Talk to you Come then. Smashing member, get free Smashing TV sessions. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, Paul. And I hope to talk to you very, very soon. Um, we, we can also now reveal who's the mystery speaker, Ooh. which is Dina Amin. Uh, so all head over to uh, main stage. And then uh, at the end of the day, we still have a party hosted by Keris, um, an emoji challenge by Yi Ying, and uh, the SEO cocktail hour by Martin Split. So there's still some fun stuff to do. Um, and I'll see you around. Bye.